Right. So I hope that you can see my screen. And um, so really what we're doing here is a series of webinars. And those webinars have been really um, touching base around the, the cortex system, but really around aspects of building a digital archive. And how do we go about building a digital archive at best practice? And so we've done a number of webinars over time. And this is, I think, the fourth in the series of webinars. And today we're speaking about enhanced discovery with dynamic metadata, which obviously is a topic that everyone really is keen on engaging with because we've had so many signups this time. And I think it is, uh, you know, it's one of those topics that everyone should do metadata, but nobody really digs deeply into it. Um, and actually, it's a fascinating field. And Rebecca is going to take us through that. But maybe just to give you some background, obviously, I'm from Africa Media Online. I started Africa Media Online in 2000. And Africa Media Online helps organizations build digital archives. That's really what we do. How do you do all the processes coming into a digital archive? So along the, that route, there's training, like these webinars. Okay, so our training is aimed at how do you build a digital archive at best practice? And what are all the processes? And how what do you need to understand about digital so that you know that you're doing what you're doing is at the right standard? So that's really what the training is about. Then we also provide a digitization service. Um, and we can digitize material at best practice. So at the metamorphosa or the FAGI standard, um, capturing materials so that what you're capturing is you're capturing at the right standards for long-term preservation. You don't want to have to do this exercise again down the line. So you want to do it right at the right, uh, right from the outs outset. And we also supply equipment. Um, for digitization. So we are the official representatives for phase one in Africa, um, which are very high end uh, digital capture devices. And, um, and we're also able to then also uh, help you build a digital archive. And that digital archive um, is done on a system. And the system that we've really been profiling particularly because it's so useful. It's kind of the recommended system for heritage collections and for academic collections is AM Cortex. And uh, Rebecca comes from, uh, from Cortex um, and she is going to be speaking to us. And in fact, she's done most of these webinars and um, today. And Cortex is a brilliant system. Really, we as I'm sure many of you know, we developed our own system over the years and found that we just could not keep up with all the innovations that were happening in the world. And so we went out kind of last year looking for best of breed systems from around the world and Cortex is one of those. And we're really delighted to be representing Cortex in Africa. And then, of course, we also work with organizations to take digital content where appropriate and make it available to publishers and broadcasters and so on um, as part of your mandate as heritage organizations to disseminate this information, make it available to the world, um, and particularly for uh, African audiences, but also global audiences around the world. So with that in mind, I am going to hand over to Rebecca, who is going to be speaking to us today about um, metadata and how to, and, and the, the title is Enhanced Discovery with Dynamic Metadata in AM Cortex. So thanks, Rebecca, and it's great to have you on the call. No worries. Can you see my screen now? we can. Amazing, thank you for confirming. So yeah, hi everybody, it's a pleasure to be with you today. Um, we're going to cover a lot, as David said in the session, and we hope to round off with a Q&A. So please do make a note of any questions as we go, or feel free to submit them into the chat and David can um, kind of group those up for the end and we can ask them out. 
A bit of background on Cortex, just very briefly for anyone who's not familiar and maybe hasn't tuned into the webinars you've already done with AMO. We are a specialist publisher, um, kind of best in class, based in the UK for heritage and um, academic collections. Uh, we work with numerous archives, libraries, universities, theological colleges, but are kind of, we have a very varied customer base but all over the world. We have a lot of customers in North America, here in the UK, and we've been working very closely with Africa and Media Online to support customers in Africa as well. And we'll show you um, at least one site that we have um, with the, the Tutu IP Trust today. Okay, cracking. So, Let's kick off then with an overview of what we're going to cover in today's session. For anyone who is unsure, we will have a brief introduction to what we mean by descriptive metadata, how it differs to other categories of metadata, and so on. I then want to provoke some thought about how this metadata can actually be deemed dynamic, introducing the idea that metadata can be more than just discursive that it can actively elevate um, engagement with an exploration of your digitized collections. But before we jump into what will form the bulk of the session, um, examining some customer examples and looking at different types of metadata available in Cortex, how they can be presented and leveraged on published sites, um, we'll also be giving you a kind of introduction to how that data actually gets configured in the administrative side of the platform. So, Cortex as a platform is a DAM, a digital asset management system, and a CMS, a content management system that allows you to manage your um, digital collections online. Um, companies that we partner with, like um, African Media Online, do the hard work with digitization. They may be doing some metadata generation for you. And then we work seamlessly with them to help you pull that into our system for presentation and management thereafter. So when I'm talking about the administrative side of the interface as we go through today's webinar, I'm talking about the, the side of the platform that your teams would be actively working in, not that your end users would be looking at. Um, and then when we're talking about the published interface, that is the side of the platform that your uh, end users would engage with. Just to be very clear on the terminology. And I, we use these terminologies all the time and I take for granted that people understand what I'm saying. So I just want to really want you to spell that out. And we are only going to be able to scratch the surface with this subject in the time we have today. I think we've roughly got 30 to 40 minutes for this and then following on with questions. But I hope by the end you'll be left full of ideas and inspired to make the mess data you have work harder for you too. Okay. So let's start with the basis of what we actually mean by descriptive metadata before we get into looking at some of this. So the Society of American Archivists defines descriptive metadata as information that refers to the intellectual content of material and aids discovery of such materials. Descriptive metadata then allows users to locate, distinguish and select materials on the basis of the material's subject or its aboutness. In a digital environment, it's often public facing this kind of metadata and can be paired with technical or administrative metadata in the DAMs in the administrative side for archival management purposes. So important to be aware that there are different types of metadata and today we are talking about this descriptive metadata describing the asset itself. It can be common when creating this kind of descriptive metadata to also imply a schema widely used in the field. So some of you may be very familiar with um, standards such as Mark 21, ISAD-G or Dublin Core, those are kind of very common ones. And we can see those on the screen here. This is just a screen grab of the administrative interface where you can actually selectively pick to drop one of those standards in and work to it straight away. But Cortex also allows you to work with custom metadata fields too. So you can, if desired, have different metadata schemas applied to different collections within your site, or you can unite all of your metadata un under a single um, single shared standard if you would prefer to have that consistency across your collections. Different customers have different approaches and what's important to know is that Cortex can flex depending on, on how you would like to apply standards, if at all. And it's this flexibility really that's key to enabling clients to expose and harvest metadata to other discovery services. Um, as standards like Dublin Core are key to, in, the term is interoperability, 
with other systems. And that just means you can push your metadata, your assets to another service if you wanted to. So in America, it's very common that customers would push their metadata to share it with like the, the DPLA hub in Australia. There's a, a main discovery service called Trove that a lot of institutions will push data to. And it, in doing that and sharing that, that data to these big discovery services, you just um, really maximize the, the opportunities for people to engage with your, with your material. They don't necessarily have to come to your site to find it. Okay. And then on this slide, really, I just really wanted to drill down in what do we what do we do with dynamic metadata and what do we actually mean by dynamic in that context? It sounds like a kind of buzzword, but it, it's very um, apt to describe exactly what we're doing. So in a traditional archival setting, descriptive metadata is rarely more than discursive. It provides crucial but limited functions, some really, in that it um, records key contextual information about an archival object. However, when it's migrated to an online environment, such as in Cortex, metadata actually has the potential to go several steps further, um, providing administrators um, with opportunities to highlight and represent relationships between digitized materials. They can actually steer user pathways through content and ensure interoperability with other systems, as I've just said. So dynamic metadata can serve your institution and users in many and varied ways. Um, as the word cloud here um, represents, and as Jeffrey Skinner's quote in the bottom right corner of the screen attests, we know that the generation of robust and accurate metadata can be an incredibly time consuming and resource intensive process. So we, in Cortex, we really want to make the most of that metadata. We want to make it work harder for you once created. An application of a few simple configuration settings in Cortex can have a really powerful impact on the search and discovery experience for your end users. Maximizing the chance of return visits to your site, but also prolonged research sessions and overall just boosting engagement with your collections more broadly. So let's now take a look at some of the key dynamic metadata functionality available in Cortex and how some of our customers um, and published Cortex sites are already making use of each. I'm just going to dip out of the PowerPoint now. It's not going to be a death by PowerPoint webinar. Um, I'm sure you'll be glad, pleased to hear. So you should now be able to see um, a screen showing the University of Liverpool's Cortex site. Um, and we can see some metadata. So this is an example of an asset presented on this, on this customer's site. So we have the image rendering on the left. And on the right hand side, we have some summary metadata. And we can see straight away that the metadata takes in different formats. And below the image viewer, we've also got the full document um, detail share. So users can selectively choose which fields they want to um, di display directly next to the image, and they can prov provide far more metadata beneath should they want to. And as you can see here, some of the metadata fields are purely discursive. So title, reproduction notice, more information. The date field actually also looks to be purely discursive, but it's important to know that dates in Cortex serve a dynamic function on their own, that of a filter. So just toggling to um, the main documents list on the Liverpool site, just to illustrate this, I can run a um, apply a date range here, 1934. I'm sure this is um, expected behavior, but just really want to flesh that out. But even though it looks purely discursive, so date fields in Cortex do apply that kind of filter, um, that function. So we can now reduce our list to 83 results to see everything within that date range. But some of the other metadata fields have these kind of gray lozenge look appearances. If I scroll down, we've got a few more here. We've got creator, object type, and repository. These indicate that the values in those lozenges are clickable and serve a dynamic functional purpose. In Cortex, we have two metadata field types that appear like this, controlled vocabularies and related assets. And I want to now kind of dig into each of those in turn, looking at how they function on, pub on a published interface then how they're configured and set up in the administrative interface afterwards. So I want to start with control vocabularies first. They're the most used of our dynamic data types and they have many different use cases. So what is a control vocabulary first? It's a list of terms or phrases configured for use within a control vocabulary field. So control vocabularies can standardize metadata and make assets more discoverable. 
Sometimes institutions may be more familiar with a term like linked data, um, and that is essentially the basis control vocabulary. They allow your users to easily find similar like-for-like -like content. So in this example, the control vocabulary creator is populated with the name of the author of the work, Olaf Stapledon. Clicking on that name will take the user to a list of all materials within that site tagged with the same controlled vocabulary term. Okay, if we return back to the main documents list on this site, we can also see that there are, oh, let's let that load. We can also see that there are under the creator sidebar filter, we can see that there are over 60 individual creator tags in use across the entire site. So including that field as a controlled vocabulary has been deemed incredibly useful by the institution. They're expecting that their users are going to want to be able to browse by creator. They have and they have configured their metadata to enable that. If I just toggle to our demo site, um, we can also see that there are some other common fields that get configured to control vocabularies, such as language. Um, we have um, the, the periodical here. So if you have newspapers or, or periodicals yourselves, you might want to name a different different titles, subjects. I mean, there's no limitation on how many fields can be set up as control vocabularies or what type of fields they cover. It's entirely subjective and down to institutional choice. But these are just common um, fields that do often get um, configured in this way. So just wanted to show you those. Another huge benefit, I'm gonna go back to Liverpool again and just um, going to Go back to that Olaf Stapleton example just to show you another use case for control vocabularies. So I followed the creator control vocabulary to a list of everything filtered and tagged with that term. So a huge benefit of control vocabularies is that when a term is selected, as I have just shown you, um, that um, URL that's created here is actually dynamic too. So what do you, in a, in a technical sense, so what I mean by that is is more content is added to the site over the next week, month, or even year, and that same term is applied to new content. Users of your site can choose to share their search. They can, you know, copy this URL and share it with colleagues, peers, whatever. They can also save the search for themselves, and they know that in doing that, that this is going to be a dynamic link so that when they return to apply that search or look at that list again in future, it will automatically pull in new content into this list that's tagged with the same term over time. So they don't need to resave the link. It, as long as you have the baseline link with the, the control vocabulary um, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the URL, it's going to pull those um, new results in each and every time. Okay. The benefits of control vocabularies also don't need to be restricted to application across asset details pages that we've seen already. They also serve very important roles on static content pages, and um, they actually form the basis of what we call list landing pages in Cortex. So let's have a look at each of these. So just scrolling back on, up on demo, I'm going to go to our browse by formats page here. Each Cortex website can contain a list landing page, such as the one you're seeing here, which can display all terms from a selected control vocabulary um, list as a set of tiles. So this control vocabulary is a format control vocabulary and it allows us to go in by all materials that are tagged with audio, authority record manuscript and so on. When a user clicks on any of these tiles, I'll just go ahead and click on the audio one there. They're taken to a list of all published assets that are tagged with that term um, with a brief description of the term and an image if, if desired. So these are just all of the audio assets that are in our demonstration site. This page has also benefit from the option to configure and present sort, um, and, sort and filter options different to those on the main asset site. Um, so if I just go to the browse all page of this website, we can see some of the filters that are configured. We can see we've got collections, type, language, and source. But on, if I go to my explore the collection page, and I'm gonna go into one of our collections list pages, first folios, we'll see that the sidebar filters can be configured to be very different from that main list. So here we only have two sidebar filters that are specifically relevant to this content, 
showing the status of it, um, whether it's metadata only or full record, and also whether it's annotated or not, because those are the key kind of components that we expect Shakespearean scholars to want to browse this content by. So just showing you the application there. And those different lists are controlled by controlled vocabularies. Okay. Alternatively, controlled vocabularies can also elevate search and discovery potential of your site um, across static content. So static content pages refer to pages that present visual or textual explanations and design features rather than asset content. And they're often contextualizing collections and subject matter. So to show you um, this, I want to just go to another customer site, which is um, a site published by Syracuse University. This is their Tob Ted Hopple collection. They actually have five, I think it's five now, sites published with Cortex, but this is a project specific one for um, this presented Ted Hopple. And the, I wanted to show you this page because they are utilizing something called search categories, which is what we can see at the bottom here. So this content item has been utilized to present their end users with a front end view of their entire controlled vocabulary lists for these certain fields. What is the benefit you might be thinking of doing this? Well, some users may arrive at your site um, and know exactly what they're interested in and looking for and dive straight into applying a search. Others might just be happy to do a gen to you know conduct a general browse. But you know, if they're unsure of what taxonomies you've applied across the site, for those users it can be quite daunting. So this content item is particularly helpful in that it gives them complete transparency straight away as to the taxonomies you've used, and the lists you've built, um, and can prompt interest in specific subjects they may not know were covered in the site otherwise. So I can, for example, um, as, as the information above informs the user, selecting one, um, multiple um, options within a certain field conducts a kind of Boolean or search. And when you start to apply terms across different um, canisters, it starts to apply um, an and brilliant operator. So I can just go here, okay, okay, I want to see everything that is, what might I want to see? Everything that is relating to, let's go to Africa. That's an obvious choice. And then choose host. I might say, okay, I want to see any um, videos that are, um, the subject matter is Africa and they are being hosted by um, Peter Jennings and Timothy Johnson. So we can see that the results go down to two already. I did that very quickly. Let me just take those back up and show you that when I selected Africa, I saw that if I initiated that search, I got 108 results. But when I then add host, we see that um, that list, I think it was these two I picked, go down drastically to two. Again, I can limit this further by saying, okay, I just want to see Peter Jennings. And then I can initiate a, um, a search and go straight to the single asset that I know is going to be extremely relevant to my research interests pairing those two key components of Africa and that, that particular host. I'm just waiting for that to load. So you can see exactly, it takes me straight to the video that's been tagged with both. So when you're trying to make the user journey very easy for your, for your um, audience, um, incorporating something like the search categories that draws from your control vocabularies um, really simplifies the, the process for them. Okay, and lastly, the one, another really popular use case of controlled vocabularies is that it can be pay, paired with page levels in Cortex to reflect and encourage browsing by archival hierarchy. So let me find, turn on a sharing tab open, it's not particularly useful. Here we go, the archive 22 site. So the the trust, the um, Tutu IP Trust had a keen desire when they were designing the site with us to guide online users through their content as they would in the physical archive. So for this particular organization, that was by fond, sub fond through to item level with fonds represented by life code that they're um, referencing on, on the homepage here. So to do so, they hid their full documents list instead utilized static content thumbnails to represent the fonds so I can click through from the font here, Elder, um, Advocate, Elder and Icon, and we go through to the sub fonts associated with that. And from there, I can then go through to any items within that sub font. Okay, and CVs underpin this entire arrangement, 
with each level from subfond configured as separate control vocabularies behind the scene. So it's a very easy setup to do. So if, if that's important for your institution, really representing archival hierarchy in the published interfaces, if that's how your end users are used to engaging with the content in a physical setting, um, that's something you can very easily achieve in Vortex as well. So hopefully you can see that control vocabularies alone <laughs> serve many dynamic functions across your site, each aiding end user discovery um, in subtle and highly effective ways. But how do we go about actually achieving that configuration as administrators? To show you that, I want to show you um, the administrative interface. So I'm just going into here. So what, what you're seeing now is the DAMS, the Digital Asset Management, Management System um, interface for our demo site. Obviously, I can't show you a customer's instance um, for security reasons, but this will, will illustrate the, the kind of setup in exactly the same way that we would perform for a customer. <clears throat> so we are in the configuration menu here. And under the configuration menu, you'll see that there's documents, fields, and section um, fields. So we're going to look at document fields straight away. But these other elements are reflecting that we can have levels of metadata in Vortex. And I'm going to loop back to that towards the end of the session, but just important to point them out here for you that you can have levels of metadata. So within this page, you can see that we have metadata fields represented on each row. So we have title, creator, um, contributor, creator date, and so on. Uh, and then we have some other options on, on the side. And, Today, we only have time to really focus on the type of metadata field. Um, and to do that, I'm just going to scroll down and start creating a new one so you can see. But when you set up metadata fields in Vortex, you have the option to drop in field clusters. So at the beginning, I mentioned we can drop in standards. So that automatically creates all the metadata fields for you that are in that standard. It takes all of the guesswork out for you, really simplifies things. But if you want to combine those uh, um, a schema with custom fields or purely work from custom fields, you can hit the custom field button. And I'm just gonna put an RL test title. You can, this can be renamed at any time, but this would be the name of the field that's appeared on your published interface. And then this is where you select the type of metadata field type that you want. So if we were selecting the control vocabulary, it's very simple to do, and we add that field. Once the field has been added, for control vocabularies, you also need to set up advanced settings. So we click through to advanced. We can largely ignore at the top here. So just for, for efficiency today, I want you to just focus on the settings at the bottom. So we can now select a particular list. So you can build lists yourself. You can work with um, established um, term lists. If you work with something like um, the Library of Congress subject headings, um, you can pull that kind of list in, or you can work from custom fields that you create yourself. And these can be built out of metadata, or you can um, really curate a list entirely dependent on how you like to work. So imagine I wanted this um, field to link to a, a, a list of countries. I can select my country list here and I can now have two options to restrict my list. So if I leave um, this set to no, it means that only one term can be selected per field. So that might be useful for something like a copyright field where you want to have a, a particular right statement and you'd only ever have one. Um, or you, if this were a subject or a country field, let's stick with countries, we've selected that. You might have um, a document that mentions multiple countries, in which case you might want to open up the opportunity for anyone on your team to tag different countries to that one asset. The setting at the bottom also allows you to set whether you're allowing unique entries or not. So as, a, as an administrator, if you're a kind of a project lead on a site, you can restrict your list to um, mean that anyone on your team has to work with that strict list of taxonomies or you can select this to yes and allow your team to gradually add content to it and you can then review those periodically as a team if you want to um, so let's just have a look at what happens i'm not going to save this setting because it's just a demonstration but if i go to the top i'm going to go just to edit an asset in the platform so you can pick oh let's Move this one. So let's go into this. This asset is marked as complete, so it's eligible for promotion. If I go in and edit that asset, we'll just have a see. So this is just the editing interface in, in, in Vortex. So we can see here things like language. If I 
hit on the drop down. This is one of the um, control vocabulary lists that allows me to select more than one. So if I wanted to say this document is partially in Latin and also in French, I can select a new term and add that. Um, but something like subjects, you know, I have this very advanced list, but there might not be a term in here that, you know, this might, um, we don't have, um, Africa isn't, um, isn't a term here. I guess that would come under country, but for now, let's just, for the purpose of demonstration, I want to add a subject term that's not in a, an existing list. And I, this um, list has been configured as we just saw to allow unique entries to be added. I can now add, so when I'm a member of your team, I can add a new term and I can save the asset. And we'll see that the status changes to incomplete because an asset cannot be promoted. It cannot be published to your, um, to your public interface until all control vocabulary terms have been approved. So this is the process you would work as a team. You would, um, you would be flagged. You see this new flag um, against the subjects list. It's prompting you as a team to come together, discuss the application of the term that's been selected. You might have multiple. You might do this on a weekly basis. And you can either choose to approve a term which adds it to the list and that asset would then be eligible for publication or you can combine it with other terms so imagine these terms were similar um if maybe it was africa and south africa or um you know anything like that you could then combine the terms and just pick exactly how you wanted that to appear so if i wanted anything tagged with alcohol or africa to just say africa i can press combine and we see that it automatically condenses those terms into one set and um, taxonomy straight away. So this is incredibly helpful for metadata cleanup on the administrative interface. It's very, very flexible. You can then amend metadata at will very easily. So that's just the basic setup of controlled vocabularies in the DAMS. Okay. So I'm just going to scroll back up here and go back to that documents field list just to show you again that whilst we selected control vocabulary, there is this option for related assets as well. And that's what I want to look at next. So mindful of the time where I'm reading, help us. Okay, so related assets is another dynamic math data field type in Cortex. It has a key difference though. Whilst it allows administrators to present connections between assets like control vocabularies, the foundation for this relationship doesn't need to be term-based. They don't need to be tagged with identical terms to present the relationship. So let's have a basic look at an example of this. Um, where can we look for that? So let's go back to demo. I'm uh, going back to uh, my periodical collection, homes and gardens. We've got a very basic example to show you this. Okay, I'll just click into the first volume of this magazine. Okay, so we're back on our homes and garden periodical asset that we looked at at the beginning. And if I scroll down to the full documents data that's underneath the image viewer, we can see this field called next volume. I hope that's clear on your screens. It's saying next volume and then the tag says home and gardens volume 2 1920 to 1921. This looks like a control vocabulary field. It has the same gray lozenge appearance, but when I click on this particular um, lozenge, I can see that I'm taken to the next volume of the same magazine. And similarly, from the bottom of this volume two, we have reciprocal links going on to volume three or back to volume one. So in this case, related assets has been used to aid end users to easily navigate assets within a series, okay? But customers are also using this in more adventurous ways. So here we've got, um, this is a, a customer in, in the UK um, called Durham County Council. And they have um, a series of Church of England parish registers. Um, and what they have done is underneath their interview, they have this field called learn more about this church, which when clicked, let's go ahead and click that takes a user through to an authority record detailing top level information about the church. So this record is not a digital asset. It's just represented by a logo of the institution accordingly, um, but rather it's an authority card or record that can help contextualize the digitized primary material. In this case, it's been used to contextualize a place, a church, but the same strategy could be employed by customers wanting to provide a historical or biographical note, 
um, pertinent to their material. So someone can come here, they can learn about the church, um, there's information underneath, and they can also link through um, our free text building cortex can be purely discursive, but we can also add HTML to add um, imagery and also links. So we can now link through back to see all of the um, registers that have been tagged with the same church. So it's just a, it's a point of reference for your users to add, easily um, contextualize the content they're looking at. So let's just dip back again then into um, the DAM to see how this would be configured. So imagine my RL test is actually going to be a related asset build. I can change that now. So to set up related assets, um, yeah, we go to advanced settings next. Sorry, cursors everywhere. And this time again, just ignoring the opportunities at the top, the only thing we have to do to configure these is to set which collections we can pull relationships between for material. So if I wanted to allow my relationships to be drawn between um, assets in the manuscripts collection and the, the magazine, the periodicals collection, I select those and hit save. It's as simple as that. Now, if I return back to manage assets and go to edit the same asset again, I scroll down to find my um, RL test field. I can remember where it is. Let's just run the search for it. Oh, geez, let's run RL. So RL test here. So now, if I click into that canvas, I'm not presented with a list of every asset in that. Um, like a, a control vocabulary option. They don't appear in exactly the same way, but I, they do start pre-populating with assets that are in the two collections I've configured. So I can now start writing the, um, the file ID, the file name of any of the assets in my periodical collection to then make the selection of which asset I wanted to link to. So I've selected to link to this one TIM HG19. This is one of the volumes of Homes and Gardens. That's now I can save that. And when promoted, we run, an, um, a promote, we run a promotion process to push your metadata through to the published interface. And when that promotion is run, that asset will now appear with a related asset link in it, taking me to the first issue of the Homes and Gardens magazine. Now, the relationships you want to draw between materials will be entirely up to you as an institution. You'll know which connections you want to make from your own research and awareness of the archive. And we select the ID in the DAMS interface, but because we know that that ID might not mean anything to the front end user, what renders instead, as we saw in that Homes and Garden example, we do not see the ID of the asset, we see the title of it. So you don't have to create the title again. It, it pulls that, it's clever enough, it just pulls that straight through for your, for your front end users. Because it's more informative for them. Okay. So that's related assets very quickly as well. And the last element of dynamic metadata that I've really got time to show you today is levels of metadata, which I pointed out in the DAMS, we have those item and section levels as well. Um, and all of the examples of metadata we've seen so far have been presenting asset level metadata. This is all metadata describing the entire asset. So this volume of magazine, um, you know, this is this is a volume of magazines that have multiple issues within it. So this metadata, the summary and the document details beneath, is all describing the entire volume. It's talking about the, it's giving a full description of the entire volume, it's allowing you to link back to another volume. It's all volume based. But you can also have these levels of metadata. So let's have a look at these. So I could have section level metadata, for example, here, which is presented. Um, above the image viewer. And this could be used in, in different ways. This, as I say, is a volume of magazines with individual issues within it. Imagine you had a book and you wanted to represent chapters within a book. You could use the same functionality um, to allow your users to jump to a specific section within the overall asset. So if I wanted to go to issue of August 1919, I can use the section level metadata to allow me to jump straight to that. I don't have to go on my browse thumb. I mean, you could browse through thumbnails and you could click through page by page, but this allows you to very easily jump to material that's of interest. On the right hand side, the contents tab is pulling through image or item level metadata that, in this case, 
has been created to capture the title of individual articles on each of the pages. So I could browse this list and um, find an article of interest. So it's the summer here, we're enjoying some rare nice weather in the UK, so I might want to look at four meals outdoors and it will jump me straight to that article um, and allow me to then start reading it, um, searching it and so on. So incredibly helpful, as I'm sure you can appreciate, like this is a, you know, hundreds of pages long document and it's very easy making the user aware. Like those search categories content item we looked at on the Ted Koppel site, it's showing your user what is there rather than it's like making them guess and trying to search and find things. It's very, that just makes it, the browsing experience very, very easy for them. And Baylor University, um, so in, the, in America, um, are another great example of a customer using levels of metadata in the same way. So in, they've got this fantastic music archive and the Black Gospel Music Collection. Um, and in this example, they have a record and they're using the contents tab to show the user that they, whilst they have photographs of the, of the different discs within the album, they can also um, jump to specific tracks on the record. So in this, in this single asset, they have some image-based files, but also some audio files. And the contents tab is allowing you to jump directly to tracks if you wanted to, or to, to view the photographed um, album itself. And just going back to the demo site, levels of metadata can also be amazing for presenting galleries. So in this particular site, we have a war and conflict collection that includes a series of prisoner of war journals. And they're interspersed with illustrations, cartoons, and so on. And we have added image level metadata to these journals to include metadata specifically describing these so that we can highlight the various doodles and illustrations. And it's this metadata that allows us to create a gallery of only the visual content from the journals. We don't have to present the journals in full, we can just pull in just the individual doodles and the illustrations. And it also allows us to present um, specific illustration filters. So we can have black and white color illustration and we have a very different subject list to the main site. So this is all powered by um, control vocabularies configured at item level. So just going back to the downs, um, we would just, the setup for these is identical to document fields. You go through and you set up your fields in exactly the same way, adding a new field, but at just different levels. And it's this layering of metadata paired with the dynamic metadata fields that really allows you to um, just really optimize the opportunities for discovery and browse across your site. Okay. So I think, um, yeah, really just to say, I mean, I know, Creating levels of metadata, can, I want to acknowledge that creating these levels of metadata can be very time consuming, but as I hope you've seen, the benefits to end user browsing discovery can't really be overstated. Um, and it, it's certainly worth the investment, even for selected collections where resourcing or funds um, for external generation of metadata might allow. And configuration of this data in the dams is so easy, it's identical. So once you've learned it for document fields, it's very easy to then roll out across um, and more complex levels. Um, and yeah, once we're using it, obviously our team would fully support you in, in doing that as well. Um, but you've seen a confirmation Cortex as a hub work for you to then present it in that sections drop down, the contents tab, that's all kind of handled within the system itself. So it's really just creating that metadata um, initially. And that's something that AMO are particularly skilled at doing. And then we can help you um, format that in the DAMS for um, the presentation options that you've seen today. So yeah, that's it. Control vocabularies, related assets and levels of metadata um, can all be used to enhance discovery of your digitized collections. Um, whilst the examples shown today are not exhaustive by any means, it does kind of show you, I hope, the kind of uh, most common applications across our community of some of these um, types. So yeah, I think we can probably now open the floor to questions. I think we've probably got 15 minutes for questions. I think David, you might be chairing this one. Yes, thank you so much, Rebecca. That was a wonderfully clear presentation of uh, what it takes to enable collections to be really discoverable. And I think there really are these two things. There's searchability and then there's discoverability. And those are two separate um, 
aspects or features you want in a collection because when someone comes into a collection and knows what they want to search for well then they use the search but if they just want to explore the collection and they have no idea what's in it well these tools become uh very very helpful um in a in in surfacing what they might be interested in and so Thank you so much for that presentation. So I have a, a question from Tulani who says, how long does it take to set up? That completely depends on the institution and the state of their metadata. So if you have very clean metadata that's ready to go, um, it will be very, very quick. You could set your field configuration up um, within 20 minutes, if that. Um, and then, obviously, if it, depending what you mean by how long does it, I'm, I'm assuming by that question, you mean how long does it take to, to configure the metadata rather than get a whole site built. <laughs> but um, configuring your metadata fields would take anywhere between 10 and 20 minutes for clean metadata. Obviously, if you need to do a little bit of work to clean that metadata up um, in your local spreadsheets or in Cortex using those controlled vocabulary functions, um, it might take a little bit longer. Um, but within an hour, you would easily be able to have um, metadata cleaned up and um, ingested into the right field configuration in Cortex. The process for actually running a build, just in case the question was meant to cover <laughs> asset ingest to launch. We have launched, I think the Tutu site, David, was like maybe two weeks. We launched that one in two weeks. It was incredibly quick. Um, but I, I think for most customers, anywhere between three to six months is a, is a kind of typical um, build cycle. Thank you, Rebecca. The, another question um, is regarding what are the ways of ingesting the metadata? This is, comes from Sanjin. If you might have spreadsheets of metadata and links to assets. Now, mm -hmm. Sanjin, maybe I can just come in there and just say we did a, a whole webinar on that and you can find that on our webinar page, but I'm sure Rebecca can speak to that as well. Yeah, of course. That webinar recording will definitely be of, of interest to you. But just to say, so today when we were looking at the edit asset interface in the dams, that's for manual catalog, which Cortex also supports. But most of our customers are working with legacy metadata and huge spreadsheets. And they, they don't do not want to be inputting that asset by asset. So we do have batch import processes for metadata. It's a very simple, as long as your metadata is saved as a CSV or a TSV, that's an Excel file type for anyone who was unsure. We can just upload that to the dams and you basically create a mapping. So you say this column in my spreadsheet needs to map to this field in my documents field configuration. And once you've done that mapping once, you don't need to touch it again. So it's very, very, very quick to do. Um, and yeah, if, any, if anybody wanted to see that in more detail, um, please reach out if the, the other webinar doesn't cover it enough and we can always show you um, in a dedicated session. And that other webinar also showed you how to clean up met, uh, uh, metadata. So Rebecca had some really very insightful ways of working in Excel and cleaning up metadata ahead of import. Um, another question coming from Tulani saying, in terms of research referencing is done the same way as any literature, including citation thereof? question is it limited to slideshow or can be animated to 3d modeling etc we have diverse collections and include photos dresses textiles artworks will the system allow it okay lots in there so um we have lots of customers who are presenting objects in cortex and they just use the kind of um they will just photograph from all angles um, object presentation of a kind of 360 view is still in development in Cortex. But um, yeah, there's, there's plenty of ways we can still present objects until that, that development is in place. The first part of that question, David, I might need you to repeat <laughs> some about citation. I can't quite remember the whole thing. Oh, Tulani, maybe you can explain. I, 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 I don't exactly understand that question. Uh, maybe you can just unmute and, and explain it for yourself. T 
Tulani, are you talking? I'm sorry, we we're not hearing you. Okay, so while we're waiting, oh, there, Tulani, go for it. Yes. Yes. Thanks. Thanks for an interesting topic. Uh, my my in terms of citation, I was looking at uh, when people come here for research purposes. Mm -hmm. We say to them they need to acknowledge us as, as an institution, in fact, as part of their referencing or bibliography. That is the, the context I was asking the question on. Okay. So, so cit yeah, citations aren't also generated in portraits, but the information is all available in the metadata and in the URL to allow for um, generation of a citation. Uh, and the, the links can be obviously incorporated as well. Does that answer the question? Yes, ma'am. Yes, it does. Perfect. Right, yeah. So so one can uh, credit content to various uh, creators as well and to the institution that is the custodian of, of that material. So absolutely. Um, any other questions coming from the floor? Otherwise, I do have some. Yes, I... Thank you, Quena. Can... I am audible. Yes, we can hear you. Uh, uh, I have a comment and a, a quick uh, key questions for Rebecca. <clears throat> My comment, I appreciate you taking the effort to give such a uh, fantastic presentation. Thank you. And um, my question, my quick que uh, key question, I would like to inquire of you, could you uh, elaborate on archives and unique collections? So to clarify that, I saw you on your one of your page, you highlight that, that, and uh, we are exploring the possibility of establishing uh, dedicated archives within our university library. Set aside a adequate space to the library materials, obtaining shelving and uh, cabinets, other things needed to create both storage space uh, and workspace for processing collections and media play equipment. So I, I, I take this as an advantage because you highlight that maybe you can assist us. Thank you. Okay. Maybe I can so come, I... Sorry, maybe I can come in there, Quena, and say absolutely Cortex is ideal for special collections in libraries. Um, so this isn't a library system, as in a system for lending out materials. This is a, a system for digital asset management of special collections, which... So one tends to do that with special collections in libraries, with, with archives, with uh, object collections in museums and so on and so forth. And this uh, platform is ideal for that use. And as you, Rebecca has shown here, um, the ability to enrich your collection and make it uh, more and more discoverable is built into Cortex, which is really a wonderful thing. Go ahead, Rebecca, sorry. No, I think, I mean, yeah, hopefully we've shown you, we've shown a range of different customer sites. There's been some um, university sites in there, um, the, the Tutu IP Trust, the kind of charitable foundations in there too, and we have showed a council website as well. So I, you don't have to present all of your materials on a Cortex site. It can be used to just highlight really special and like really um, heavily used collections. And, and certainly for a lot of our customers, they will start their site with that in mind so all of these sites evolve over time you know digitization doesn't happen overnight so they will usually try and get their most popular collections online to, to enable them to take resourcing off 
um, the physical archive with requests being made to access content, it makes it immediately available to their users. And then they can gradually evolve it over time and they can look to increase footprint over time and as costs allow. So um, yeah, it can evolve with you and with your collections at any pace that you would like to work to. Great, thanks Rebecca. Sanjan has a Thanks very much. Um, and he says, uh, he says, can the DAM system handle multiple file versions for an item? For example, preservation or service copies that are hidden from the public users, but have an access copy that is visible. Absolutely. So we support a whole host of file types in Cortex. Certain file types are optimized for um, online presentation. So, for example, if we take an image-based file, you would be able to technically ingest a TIFF into Cortex. And what that does upon ingest is Cortex will then generate a um, JPEG access copy that's used for um, presentation in the image viewer. But the deep, um, the deep zoom tiles and things that allow that really focused search will draw on a high quality TIFF. There's a trade-off there, just to be mindful of. So whilst you can ingest these kind of master um, files and create your access copies, doing so will also eat up more of your footprint. So obviously the larger the file size, the larger uh, the, the more of your of your digital footprint. And that's how Cortex is kind of charged, is based on, on hosting footprint um, would, would be. So lots of our customers actually prefer to ingest only the access copies, the JPEGs, the MP3s, and save the bigger files like TIFFs or WAVs, MOVs, and so on. Um, they will have a dedicated preservation system that they use to um, archive and preserve that content. And we just work with the access copies because it's cheaper. And as you, as you will have seen, the quality of Zoom and things is still amazing for, for any images that are captured at a kind of 200 DPI uh, rating we can achieve amazing um, results in the interface so we actually partner with a dedicated preservation system called preservica um, that um, many of our customers use for that for that and you can ingest materials straight from preservica into cortex then so you can ingest them is the short answer there's just considerations to bear in mind as you explore that for your own archive and we'd be happy to to have a conversation with you and, and provide some guidance on that if you needed it. Great, thanks, Rebecca. Any other questions? Uh, we've got, we're like in our last minute. Please feel free to reach out to me um, at any time if you're wanting a demonstration of the system and Rebecca and I can do that for you. Um, if you have any questions as well, we are more than happy to make time. We can all do it on a Zoom call um, and, and, and walk you through your specific needs. And really that's what we want to understand is what is your particular use case? What is your need? And then we can make some recommendations as in that regard. So please do feel free to reach out to me. Um, my email address is editor at africamediaonline.com. I'm just putting it. I'll put my um, email in the chat as well. Anyone who needs and and we will make the video of this um, webinar available to you as well. So you'll be getting that. Right. If there are no more questions, thank you very much for coming, everybody. And it was wonderful having you. And thank you so much to Rebecca for an excellent presentation that really gave us an insight into the possibilities of making collections thoroughly explorable in a very ordered and um, uh, sustainable way. Thanks so much. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye. Please feel free to hang around and ask further questions. We will wait for some time um, if you have any questions. But the webinar is officially closed but you can feel free to ask any questions. Hello, David. Hi, Delight.
Oh, how are you doing? Good, and yourself? Fine, thanks. Maybe you might have missed my question earlier. Oh, I did, I think. Sorry. <laughs> no, that's fine, that's fine. Um, I had just asked, I, I was interested to find out if um, the system is very good at balancing um, search terms and queries, especially from users. Or would it be um, more restrictive to the terms that are actually used to describe the physical asset? Um, I get to see a lot of problems in terms of searching for digital assets or items in a collection, especially if the keywords are very restrictive. Um, I thought maybe the platform <coughs> has the capability of um, providing enhanced search and um, retrieve capabilities. So maybe that, that's where my question was to see if it's able to allow us to find information, even if we don't use the exact terms that were allocated or used to describe those assets, especially from the user perspective. Sorry, did I, um, I don't know, David, if you are, but I found that quite hard to hear. Just You're very, very quiet. Hey, maybe um, I can say it again, just on Delight's uh, behalf. So, <laughs> Delight is, is worried about people searching for terms that may be related to the subject matter, but not using the exact terms that are being used in the metadata of a particular asset. So mm -hmm. is there the ability, is there some ability for people to still find what they are looking for, even though they don't know what the preferred term is? Yeah, yeah, thank you, yeah, David. Exactly. Sorry, Delight, you're just very quiet for me. But yes, there absolutely is. We have a feature called related search terms, which essentially works as a kind of thesaurus, where in the downs, you as an administrator can set a list of um, of terms. So maybe places. Places are a common use for this because, you know, names of places change over time. Um, and you can set an authority term um, that if some an, an associated term with it. So if you wanted, um, so let's think of an example. If um, <laughs> in the England, we, so you might have the term chocolate might be a main subject term. And um, in the UK, we have brands of chocolate. So somebody might search for Cadbury's and the term, the asset isn't actually tagged with the term Cadbury's, but because you have this related search term in the back, you're telling the system, if somebody search for Cadbury, show them everything tagged with chocolate. Um, and that they can then search more specifically in the transcription for the exact term category if they wanted to. So you can absolutely make sure that somebody searching for a term that's not quite met in your taxonomies still returns useful results to them. And um, the way you do that is you just create a list with your master term and then any associated term with it in another column. It's very, very simple to do. Okay, no, thank you, thank you for that. So, um, in terms of um, searching, setting up all those um, uh, authoritative terms and the like, wouldn't that be a lot of work, especially given that maybe sometimes building a collection takes quite a lot of metadata description and um, perhaps keyword entry and um, all that work? Um, how best would you advise us if we're trying to maybe build a collection? maybe um, describe it as um, as simply as possible, but still be as exhaustive to at least cater for all these other terms that come from the public. I think partnering with a specialist in metadata generation, such as Africa Media Online, is key. They can tend to do this in a very affordable and accurate way for you. Um, so really getting specialists involved. If you don't have the resourcing at your own institution to create that metadata, they can advise you on the, the most popular fields that somebody might want to navigate by in a digital collection and advise you then on the metadata to create to support that. And then, I mean, I know lots of people are trialing lots of AI functionality for metadata generation as well. So there might be opportunities there but I still think we're quite in the infancy of AI for metadata generation. So I don't think we completely do away with yet. <laughs> um, who knows how quickly these things will change, but I think we still need that element of human 
uh, management and discretion applied to, you know, how useful is it for five photographs of rivers to all be tagged with the term bridge? You know, it's not that useful for your customers. We need to be able to, if you're going to highlight that there are bridges, you need to say which bridges to make it helpful. Otherwise, you're just given an overwhelming list of everything tagged with the same terminology that isn't really meaningful. So, yeah, I think, I mean, David, you probably have more to add to that. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so we do have a metadata service um, that we and we work with lots of institutions to undertake metadata projects as well as digitization projects. Um, so yes, that that is something that is available. And really, it is about us understanding exactly what you're trying to accomplish, Delight, and and then trying to uh, work with you on that. So the maybe you know elements that need to be done in-house and other elements that can be outsourced and sometimes we have a, a team that comes on site and harvests metadata from the actual materials to uh, another team that is sitting more remote and they're then uh, taking that harvested context and turning it into metadata that uh, end users would want to search yeah. Oh, you know, thanks. thanks so much, David. Good. Thanks so much, Rebecca. I think I'm out of it. Good. Thanks, Dan. Right. Thank you. Any other questions from anyone? Tulani, anything from you? I know you've asked some questions. Bongiwe? No, no, I'm covered. Thanks. Okay, great. So this, just for you, Tulani, this system can really do, you know, everything that's in your collections there at um, local history museums and in the Durban, you know, the various museums in Durban um, can be catered for within Cortex. Um, and and certainly we, we've been also working on... Uh, you know, preservation in the back end as well with Cortex as the front end system. Um, so both the middleware, you've heard Rebecca speak about the dams, the digital asset management system side of the system, and yes. then the CMS, which is the content management system, which is the display to the end user. So Cortex is just brilliant at that. And I haven't come across a better system. Okay. Great. Well, thank you, everybody. It's been great having you all. Thank you for your interest and engagement. And um, hopefully we'll be chatting further. Okay. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thank you.